Newsmaker Show with Kevin Doran on News Talk AM 1480 WLEA. Well, here we go on the Friday Newsmaker Show with Dr. Robert Heineman, Alfred University Professor of Political Science. Dr. Heineman, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, as always, Brian. Dr. Heineman, first want to get this out of the way. The grand jury decision out of New York City, no indictment of a New York uh, City police officer over the death of Eric Garner. Your thoughts there? I do think that in Ferguson and in New York City, uh, what you're seeing again, as I mentioned, I think maybe on the last show, that a lot of this is sort of the the uh, uh, last embers of this whole civil rights um, effort that started way back in the 50s and 60s uh, with really pretty legitimate causes. Uh, today, um, the effort, I think, uh, more and more has deteriorated into kind of a, a personalized, personalized effort by people like Al Sharpton, who's operating, I think, basically on the dynamics, the internal dynamics of trying to foment as much trouble as he can in order to promote his agenda. And I think uh, the fact of the matter is a lot of African Americans uh, have had enough and uh, in the sense that they just want to get on about their business. And I think it's interesting that our good friend Charles Barkley uh, has spoken up uh, in this respect and made it plain that um, the police are doing the best they can. I think we can't pick out certain incidents that don't go our way and act like the cops are all bad. Uh, I hate when we do that because think about it. Uh, do you know how bad some of these neighborhoods would be if it wasn't for the cops? Charles Barkley there appearing on a Philadelphia radio station. Now, this is not to say that it's not of some use to keep... Uh, the local police departments, I think, responsible. And uh, the idea that they uh, may uh, use excessive force, I, I, you know, I'm sure if you're a member of a minority community, you can certainly cite plenty of examples there. There was a guest on the Sean Hannity show who is a uh, attorney who said that he handled a lot of cases of people from all different backgrounds who had been um, killed in police-involved incidents very interesting guest. He seemed to think that the Ferguson case was not a, a great example of this, but he seemed to right. think that the guy in New York City, Eric Garner, was a lot more innocent than Michael Brown. Yes, yes. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, and I don't know what Garner's background was, whether he'd had run-ins with the cops before. They said he had numerous run-ins on yeah, petty apparently stuff. Apparently a very large uh, fellow, so in terms of getting him under control and such, uh, I guess you can see why the cops went to the chokehold, um, but yeah, there are there. I think there is a um, there are some cops who basically are are exceeding or pushing the envelope out there on the streets. I think most cops don't do that at all and put up with a lot of guff, um, and uh, you know that's part of their job. But uh, no, I agree. I think the case in New York City, frankly, is uh, um, a much more <laughs> Much clearer case of uh, an innocent fellow, basically, uh, and it's an accident. I don't think there's a question there. So the difference between Ferguson and the one in New York City is the police officer shot the guy and intended to shoot him. New York City, I don't think the cops. No, the guy had asthma and a lot of health right. problems. Yeah, I don't no, think no. that it was the intent. Yeah, right, to, uh, to, uh, to kill him. It just happened. So anytime you have uh, police officers in this kind of situation... And uh, the other situation in New York City where the uh, police officers in the housing authority uh, shot this guy in a dark hall who was totally unarmed uh, and a rookie cop and uh, clearly just an accident, a tragic accident. But um, with these kinds of uh, situations out there and, and the cops um, obviously in a lot of these areas um, – very body ten, cameras, is that the way to go? Situation. That's the way. Body cameras, de Blasio, Cuomo, and Obama, they all want them, the governor, the president, and the mayor of New York City. Wow, that's quite a lineup. Yeah. Your thoughts? Well, no, it's not a bad idea. In fact, when I was uh, on the village board in Alfred, I suggested the cops uh, carry cameras, uh, pick up a lot of what was going on. That was long before the day of uh, body cameras, though. But no, it's not a bad idea, and I think a lot of 
police cars now uh, have cameras on them. Right. Uh, to uh, when they apprehend or pull somebody over, they can uh, uh, film the whole uh, incident. And that's to protect, frankly, uh, the cops and probably to uh, protect the defendants as well. Uh, so I don't have any problem with that. I do think, though, that President Obama has uh, drawn this uh, Ferguson situation out uh, a lot farther than it needs to be drawn out. I think uh, by calling people to the White House and holding conferences on this sort of thing, I think all it does is continually kind of stir things up. But my read on Ferguson is that most of the people in Ferguson, black and white, would just like this to quiet down and so they could get on with their business, rebuild their stores and uh, get back to work. Um, Governor Cuomo complimented Eric Garner's family, saying that they were calling for peace publicly, and Cuomo said he met with them privately and in the same exact way. They don't want riots. They want the protest to stay peaceful. Right, and they have every right to protest. Uh, let's be clear on that. Um, uh, and uh, I, I I don't blame them. Uh, but uh, uh, the, I believe the chokehold uh, at New York City is among the police is uh, outlawed now, if that's what you, the term you would use. The police are not allowed to use the chokehold. And that's probably not a bad idea either. Now, again, my son uh, was in judo for many years. And uh, one of the holds in judo, uh, which is known as the peaceful way, uh, once you get to be, I think, 13 or 16, is a chokehold. So you're out there on the mat throwing each other around, breathing hard, and you can put a choke on a person. There are two or three ways you can do that. Sure. And uh, normally they will pad out, but sometimes they will, you will choke them unconscious, at which point they pat them out again. Now, the point I'm making here, Brian, is the next time around in a match, if you just put your knuckles on the carotid or just put a, a little tension there, that kid will go out immediately. I hear you. You don't have to choke them at all. Once they're choked out, after that... They ch- and so a, a chokehold like with the New York City cops, if somebody's been choked out before, I mean, they're going to go unconscious right away. Ah! Yeah, no, it's, uh, so uh, it is a, you know, it's a pretty... Effective yeah. technique there, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Heineman knows about. Yeah, well, uh, you'd have to talk to my son. He was in the national finals. I was not. Sure thing. Back to body cameras for a moment. Hornell Police Chief Ted Murray told our news department uh, on the record on the year that um, he would be very comfortable with body cameras because he's got a well-behaved police department. They don't get into trouble with those sorts of things. Well, that's fine. No, I think uh, there's no reason why the police couldn't use body cameras at all. Um, And I think, uh, you know, most police are pretty well-behaved. But any cop, and you know as well as I do, and, and we've trained a lot of police officers at Alfred University, um, after a while, they, they're they suspicious of <laughs> You can just tell they're suspicious of everyone and everything because that's what they're dealing with day in and day out. Right, right. Not that they're not decent people all the way, but they just have to be suspicious. And so sure. uh, that's where uh, the body cameras can help them and I think protect some people as, uh, on the street as well. Moving on to uh, Washington politics. New House, new Senate. Uh, the House was Republican-controlled before. Now the Senate is. So you've got uh, two out of the three right. uh, legislative branches down there in D.C. Uh, completely GOP-controlled. Uh, you That's a question, That's Brian? a question. When I point at you, that's a question. Oh, Dr. I see. Heineman. Okay, yes. Um, well, I think uh, there are a number of things uh, that uh, come to the f- front here. Uh, one, the question of the budget, uh, the, bu- uh, the funding for the government. Now, uh, under Obama, uh, Congress has never passed a budget. So we've gone almost, what, six years, more than six years, and Obama's budgets have never, ever been passed in, t- in total. What the Congress has been doing is basically proceeding with what are called continuing resolutions, which means that uh, they pass legislation allowing agencies to spend pretty much at the level they spent before. So it does kind of keep uh, uh, spending down, uh, but it's a half-baked way to proceed. And right now, of course, uh, the last latest spending resolution is, expi- is expiring. So there's talk that somehow uh, Congress should uh, not renew 
the spending authority for the president and let uh, Congress or let the government shut down. I don't think any leaders in the House or Senate on the Republican side want to see any kind of government shutdown. So the first step here is to uh, continue to extend uh, the spending, and Boehner wants to extend it through next September, which will be the end of the fiscal year, and get that off the table so they can get on to some other issues, uh, and a number of which are include things like uh, the Keystone Pipeline, the uh, uh, need for tax reform, and uh, some, some way come up with a compromise on immigration. I mean, these are things that... Uh, these are problems that need to be dealt with, especially tax reform. But I, I don't know, Brian, to be frank, whether you're ever going to get any kind of effective tax reform anymore. I mean, Out just, of Washington. Right. There are just too many interests who are got a hold on uh, the tax code. Your and, former student, Congressman Tom Reed, seems to push for that. Yes, he does. And uh, I certainly support him on that. Uh, to simplify the tax code and take out some of those um, benefits that, Industry and business and uh, other special interests get would be a very good idea, but uh, I tell you, it's a tough, tough task. Another big Congressman Tom Reed issue is sexual harassment on college campuses. Uh, New York Senator, U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has been big on that this week, uh, talking about the sexual harassment in the Navy story with the submarine uh, snooping. Snooping, the, uh, snooping in the shower, huh? Yeah, that one, oh, uh, where the some of the sailors were allegedly um, videotaping uh, the female officers in the shower. She's also pushing uh, to fight um, sexual harassment and assault on college campuses. Right. And that's something that she's worked with Congressman Tom Reed on. Your thoughts on these two big stories of sexual harassment in the news this week? Well, I... Uh uh, first of all, obviously, Gillibrand has gotten herself a niche there, which she's going to play um, to the hilt. And I assume pretty soon there'll be a book coming out by her on this issue. Um, on the other hand, it is a serious issue. I mean, I don't think there's any question about it. Um, in the you middle, know, she said that she went through that herself, and that Daniel Inouye, the senator from Hawaii, yeah, she I, said that Inouye was making some annoying comments. Probably the average pregnant woman doesn't appreciate that too much. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. What what women take, uh, you know, comments like that. Sure, I'm I'm not sure how 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 you play that, but I I am sure that the issue of uh, sexual harassment on campuses is a serious issue. I, there's just no question about it. New York State now. The SUNY system has just come out with a um, set of procedures that all the SUNY schools have to follow. The yes means yes. Uh, yeah, on and on and on. And, um, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's one way of uh, slowing all this down. But one of the basic problems, I think, is the culture that is encouraged, unfortunately, by uh, college administrations uh, throughout the country. And they have other priorities that they're more concerned about, like football, basketball, uh, lacrosse, uh, whatever it happens to be. And uh, if they've got uh, athletes who somehow uh, cross the line on sexual activities, they're going to cover for them. And you can see it uh, here again and again and again. It really has gotten to the point where uh, Division I sports uh, is a joke. A tragic joke. The idea that these guys are college students is really uh, an embarrassment, I think, in many ways to American education. Now, this is not to say that some schools, Stanford, uh, Notre Dame, and uh, some others don't uh, hold these guys to solid standards. But uh, more and more, the the huge media uh, investment in these things and talking about a, what, what are we going to have now, a college division one college football uh, playoff. Uh, I mean, this is just, uh, the whole thing is... Uh, do, you think the press is un- do you think the press is unfair to some of the NFL and others, or, 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 is, or is the press right on this? I don't know. What are you talking about? Well, like there? the Ray Rice stuff. And what and the press's view on that? Yeah, are, are, they, are they pushing too hard uh, to clean up the NFL? No, I don't think you can push too hard to clean up the NFL. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the Ray Rice thing, that uh, 
uh, Rice's uh, attorneys went to a federal judge who is notorious uh, for uh, sweeping this stuff under the rug. And uh, so he's uh, Rice apparently is not the first uh, NFL player that uh, has been brought before this guy, and the guy pretty much overturns what the NFL does. Uh, now, again, that comes from some of my students in class, so you'd have to, <laughs> you'd have to double check that. But I think it's outrageous. I think uh, the guy from the NFL uh, finally did something that made some sense, which was to uh, suspend Rice from, from football. Um, and uh, then for the federal uh, judge to come in, it's just, uh, it's just outrageous. Time is winding down. We're talking with Dr. Robert Heinemann on the Newsmaker Show this morning. Brian O'Neill filling in for Kevin Doran. Dr. Heinemann, the Republicans challenged to the Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare, a number of states doing that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we do have coming up down the pike here uh, a, a constitutional confrontation here between Congress and Obama. I'm betting that Obama will back off. Uh now, uh, the, the one, uh, some of the challenges that the Republicans in the states are, are making here on the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, Obama apparently has funded some of these Medicaid uh, subsidy programs on his own. And uh, what uh, our listeners have to understand, that any law or any program that's set up at the national level requires generally two statutes. One statute authorizes it. Uh, spells out uh, what it'll be, how long it'll last, that sort of thing. That would be that for the Affordable Health Care Act. But then these programs need a second law which appropriates money to carry them into effect. And apparently Congress did not appropriate money to carry into effect the part of the uh, Medicaid program that Obama has gone ahead and decided to allocate funds to. He can't do that. And uh, that's where he's going to be challenged. And I don't think he's going to win on the courts on that. Final question, Dr. Robert Heineman. Justice Judith Ginsburg. No, that would not be Judith. It would be Ruth. That's right. It was close, though. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Ginsburg is being pressured to resign. Well, no, they, yeah. No, the liberals are really uh, unhappy with uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, who is a very bright uh, person, a very... Uh, solid justice, and a very liberal justice. But as you know, she has pancreatic cancer, and now this past uh, couple of weeks she's had a uh, stent put in, and she had heart problems, and she's hanging on. She's refusing to uh, step down and retire, and the liberals are going nuts because uh, if she doesn't retire shortly, uh, they're not going to have a chance to replace her with another liberal. And uh, within three months, two months, that chance is going to go down the uh, tank because with the Republicans in control of the Senate, I think Obama is going to be forced uh, uh, to nominate someone who is considerably less liberal than Ginsburg. But there are a lot of good people out there, don't get me wrong, but uh, uh, the chances of putting uh, another uh, liberal to the extent of Ginsburg are dropping off dramatically. But she doesn't give any indication she's ready to step down. So. P.S. here, a follow-up to the final question. So it's the final, final question. Do you think the Republicans will win next time? Win what? The White House. Uh, yes. Who will it be? Uh, I have no idea, Brian. I have no idea. I mean, that's... Uh, it's if early it's, in the morning here. The establishment wants Jeb. The Tea Party types, they're leaning towards Rand. Yeah, I'd say there's some of that, but I don't think the Tea Party has nearly the clout today that it had before. Not that it didn't serve a, a useful function, don't get me wrong. and uh, uh, But I think they're being they're mellowing out a little bit. And um, so I uh, Rand, no, I, I, I don't know who it was I heard the other day said, I don't want another senator. Uh, running for the presidency, and they're absolutely right. So it's got to be uh, some. It's got to be a former governor of some sort. I think that's. And there are probably five to half a dozen out there that are certainly legitimate candidates. Dr. Robert Hyman, thanks for joining us. Yes.